Good morning. I would also like to join the other uh, presenters in thanking the organizers for the invitation and the opportunity to present today. I'm going to be providing a very brief summary of some of the work that we're doing in the United States uh, using autocidal methods against both Aedes aegypti as well as Aedes albopictus. I'll be talking about two different procedures. One will be Wolbachia. We've already heard a little bit of discussion about Wolbachia already this morning. There'll be a talk later after me uh, that will focus on Wolbachia. So I'm going to just very briefly go through that work, but then focus on actually another pyroproxifen-based approach uh, that we're using. So an analogy that I use to bring up uh, and discuss autocidal approaches is uh, this orchard here. If you were the owner of this orchard and it was time to pollinate these trees and so you get lots of almonds, uh, you probably would not go out and hire an army of workers with small brushes to transfer pollen from flower to flower. Uh, if you did, you'd probably go out of business pretty soon. Uh, instead, we rely on this ancient symbiosis between insects and humans. Uh, we rely on bees to naturally go out and carry pollen from flower to flower. There is some analogy between this uh, huge number of trees and the number of blossoms and the, the amount of work that would take to hand pollinate this entire orchard and what we're asking of our abatement professionals. If you look at this uh, image down here in the lower uh, left, you can see the, the enormous potential breeding sites. Each one of these homes can have th literally hundreds of small cryptic breeding sites that we've heard some discussion about. Uh, you also have sites like this where, again, a few milliliters trapped within a small crevice can, can serve as a breeding site. Not only difficult to find, but also difficult to, to deliver pesticide. And so that's the, 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 the secret sauce, if you will, of autocidal approaches. It's, it's about the delivery. It's using insects as a tool to help us, to help us do our work. So the first project that I mentioned is uh, Wolbachia. So Wolbachia, as you've heard about already, is an obligate intracellular bacterium. It occurs in many, many insects. It's estimated to occur in over half of all insect species. It also occurs in other in invertebrates, uh, ticks, filarial worms, mites, uh, crustaceans, uh, but it occurs in butterflies and bees and crickets and it also occurs in mosquitoes. A reason why it's been so successful evolutionarily is that it's able to manipulate the reproduction of its host. And in mosquitoes, this is known as cytoplasmic incompatibility. Uh, Wolbachia only grows inside the cytoplasm of its host cells. We can't grow it uh, free on a petri plate. Uh, and it is maternally inherited. It's only passed through females to their offspring. And here's a cloud of Wolbachia that you can see in the pole of this, of this egg. So it goes from mom to the offspring. And in mosquitoes, this pattern of cytoplasmic incompatibility can be summarized like this. Essentially, if the male and female have the same Wolbachia type, so here uh, these individuals have uh, the blue-red combination, and then here's some individuals that have a green Wolbachia type. If both the male and female have the same Wolbachia type, then Wolbachia is silent. You don't see any sterility. It's only in the crosses where the male has a different infection type than his mate. That's when you see incompatibility. And so in this pattern, if mom is green and dad is the other color, it's, you, the eggs don't hatch. And the same in the opposite direction. Now, in the United States, this is being regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency as a microbial pesticide. So it's the same as Bt, same as Bacillus thuringiensis. <coughs> and we've been working with the EPA now for three or four years. And we have uh, permits for experimental trials. And we now have done uh, uh, three years of experimental trials in the United States. And I'll just quickly summarize some of that work. Our first year was in 2014. It was done in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, uh, and it was against Aedes albopictus. Uh, and so we released uh, 10,000 males per week uh, at an individual home. Now this is very different from the way this type of sterile insect technique is traditionally done. Usually it's done over an entire city or a county or even a whole state. Uh, it's, it's SIT's been shown to eliminate uh, we've eliminated screwworm from the United States using this approach. So we know that it works on a very large scale. Our question was, could it also be used as a localized suppression tool? 
Do you have to do this on a, on a continental scale, or can you also use it for, to set up a zone of protection around an individual household? So that was kind of the point of this study. And we used uh, oviposition cups to catch, uh, capture eggs. We counted egg number, also looked at egg hatch, and then also used BG traps to monitor the adult population size. Uh, and here's the site where we did it. Uh, this is uh, Kentucky, the state of Kentucky, uh, and uh, this is Fayette County. This is the uh, campus of the University of Kentucky, and it was just right over here in what we call the fraternity ghettos. Uh, a lot of uh, beer cups and things around for the mosquitoes to breed in. Uh, and here are the results. This has been published recently in scientific reports, and so if anybody needs the citation, I'm glad to provide that to them. Uh, this is uh, prior to the releases. This is showing the control, the, the untreated and the treated site, if you will. Uh, you can see that the, uh, uh, this is the number of adult females and the BG traps. They tracked each other fairly well. Uh, no difference between the sites. This is, again, before we started releasing the male mosquitoes. And here's 2014, after we started the releases, again, at this one, one home. Uh, you can see the BG traps uh, were uh, catching an increased number of males. You would expect that. We're releasing thousands every week. Uh, but also we see a significant reduction in the number of females. And we believe that this is because the Wolbachia infected males were effectively sterilizing those females. The sterile females laid eggs that don't hatch, and so therefore the population goes down. After this initial success, we then carried this work also to New York and also Los Angeles. These are very different ecological contexts. Um, and again, I'm just skimming through this. Uh, I'm glad to provide additional information, but in, in a quick uh, summary about Albopictus, this data has now been submitted to the Environmental Protection Agency, and we are seeking full registration to use this as a pesticide in the United States. I wanted to quickly move forward that, to let you know that we are also testing this approach in Aedes aegypti. <coughs> Uh, this is actually some laboratory tests. Uh, this is a population, uh, uh, time is on the x-axis and then the population size is on the y-axis. These vertical bars show releases of these uh, male mosquitoes. And you can see once we start these releases, we're able to eliminate the population that's being treated. Again, this is through that sterile insect, uh, the, the, the cytoplasmic incompatibility that's able to cause the sterility in the, in the mosquitoes. And again, I'm not going to provide much data for the field trials, which are just recently ended, uh, but I would point you to this link. And again, I'm glad to, to provide this to people if they're interested. Uh, this is our collaborators, the Consolidated Mosquito Abatement District. Uh, they have many, uh, uh, much information available to the community to inform them. I think they've done a fantastic job of describing this technology. So again, I would encourage you to take a look at this. It shows you where the releases are being made and shows a calendar when the releases and that sort of thing. Uh, this next summer, so the summer of 2017, our plan is to again uh, extend our work here in uh, Clovis, California, uh, but also uh, potential sites in Los Angeles as well as going to Florida. Again, uh, trying these, not only the dry, arid climates in California, but also the very tropical environments in Florida. So with that, I'm going to stop with Wolbachia. Uh, hopefully there might be some questions later, but I'm going to change gears and talk a bit about a different procedure that we're calling ADAM, uh, auto dissemination by autocidal males. So we all know that mosquitoes are vectors. So our question is, can mosquitoes also vector pesticide? And so here, the idea is that we, again, are mass producing mosquitoes, and we're dusting them with small doses of pyroproxifen and then releasing them into the environment. Those males can then directly transfer the pyroproxifen into breeding sites or cross-contaminate females during mating attempts, and then those females indirectly carry the pyroproxifen into the, the, the breeding sites. If you only hear one thing this talk, uh, please listen to the following. If, if your many countries here are already doing SIT-type approaches, you're already releasing mosquitoes, maybe it's riddle. Maybe it's Wolbachia, maybe it's, who knows, maybe who knows what you're doing. But you already have the infrastructure, you're already rearing lots of males. You're already doing the hard part. What this does is, this is a very simple addition of adding a little bit of pyroproxifen to your males before you release them, and it basically increases the, the, the killing potential of those males. And most notably, if you're in an area that has both Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti, 
then by releasing one species, Aedes aegypti, you can potentially have an effect on Albopictus or Japonicus or other species that are also occurring in those containers. So just a quick summary of, uh, uh, yeah, so this is actually a video. If, if you can hit the play button, that would be wonderful. This is uh, Jody, and she does a much better job Today explaining it than I do. Is, um, we are about to do our eighth release for um, a project that we've called Adam. Um, and it's basically involves the release of male mosquitoes, which male mosquitoes do not bite. Uh, only the females bite. The females need uh, blood to produce eggs. So all the mosquitoes that we're gonna be releasing today, they're actually not gonna go out and bite anybody. Uh, but they are covered with a very small amount of insecticide. And so what's gonna happen is once we release these males, they're gonna go into this neighborhood. And the thing about this mosquito is they don't move around very much. So they're not gonna fly very far from this area. In fact, they're gonna stay really close to where we're gonna be releasing them. They're gonna go find females to mate with. Once they mate with the female, they can transfer some of the insecticide that's on them to the female. And then the female will then go and visit any sites in this area that are holding small amounts of water to lay her eggs in. This mosquito prefers very small containers, very small water sources. Um, and so when she goes to lay her eggs in those sources, that insecticide that she got from the male will then be deposited into that source and hopefully treat any larvae that are in there. So any immature mosquitoes will get then, will then be treated um, by her activity of laying eggs, preventing more mosquitoes from coming off into this neighborhood. I took the dogs out with 10 o'clock the other night and got three bites. Yeah. And I've gotten to the point where I keep mosquito spray right by the back door, and before I go out now, I spray because I'm tired of getting. Yeah, and evil. we don't. They are doing a fantastic job, and I'm so thankful that they are pursuing this project because we really have a lot of mosquitoes around, and we are afraid that we might get uh, uh, Nile virus from these mosquitoes. So what these folks are doing, I am deeply appreciative. It doesn't affect the adults that are already here. So this release doesn't, you don't see that immediate control effect. But over time, what we hope is that all of these sources that we're not able to find will be treated by these mosquitoes um, and thus bring down the overall number of mosquitoes in this neighborhood. So what, what you're seeing there is uh, the operational use of, of how this works. Those, those uh, mosquitoes are actually being made in Kentucky, which if you don't know, that's more towards the east coast of the United States. Uh, they are the, the, they're reared to adults, the females are removed, they are placed into those tubes that you saw, dusted with pyroproxen, and shipped to California. So the abatement district receives the males ready to go. They just go out and release the males. So they, they don't have to do any rearing or anything complicated like that. So this is essentially how one of these studies looks. This is a, a trial that we did with Aedes albopictus. The, the study that you just saw in California is with Aegypti. Uh, but this is an early study that we did with Albopictus in Kentucky. We have a single release point uh, and then little cups of water, ova cups that are placed up to 150 meters away from that site. In this study, it was only in one direction. And then the blue circles are uh, BG traps that we're using to monitor the, the population. And so then after we release these males, we go and basically pull water samples from these ova cups, take those samples back to the lab and use them in bioassays. So it's a very simple experiment. We add four larvae into those water samples and ask the question, do the larvae die? We compare that to an, a, treat that, a site that has not been treated. Results, uh, just a quick summary here. Again, this has been published and I'm glad to provide the reference if, if anyone needs that. So here's the study with time on the, uh, the x-axis. These uh, vertical bars are the four releases of about 10,000 males each. Uh, just focus on this lower slide, if you will. Um, it's basically showing the mortality. And what you can see at the untreated site, which is this black line, uh, there is essentially no mortality, uh, very high survivorship, if you will. But at the treated site, even up to 150 meters away, when we pull those water samples, they are highly toxic to the larva. Uh, and this is another uh, study that we did, again, with albopictus. Uh, Pre-treatment, the treated and untreated sites were very similar, but after we started the treatment, we saw a significant decline in larval survivorship in those bioassays. And as you would think, uh, as you would expect, as you move away from the release point, you see a decrease in the toxicity. So less of the, uh, we, we know these aegypti and the albopictus don't fly, fly very far, and so as you move away from the release point, the, the toxicity drops off. Now, of course, in operationally, you're not going to release at a single point. You're going to do this like a classical sterile insect technique. You're going to release throughout the, the entire city.
But here we're just interested to look at how far the pyroproxmin uh, moves from a single point. We've repeated this work now. Uh, this is uh, work that we did this past summer. This is 80s Egypti in Los Angeles. Again, we see uh, the red bars. This is uh, toxicity uh, in those bioassays, and we see a significantly higher toxicity at the treated site compared to the untreated site, and also a significant reduction. This is the number of adult females. I apologize for the small text size. Um, but you can see that there is a, a significant decrease in the population uh, compared to the untreated site. This is uh, Los Angeles, and then this is Florida. Here's the site. It's a boatyard. You can see there's a lot of junk, old motors where potential breeding sites in there. Again, a significant increase in uh, larval mortality uh, only during the release period, uh, and again, a, a significant reduction in the adult population size. Now, a point that's been made repeatedly is this is not a magic bullet. This is probably not going to work to knock out very large pools of uh, uh, very large breeding sites. If you have an abandoned swimming pool, this is probably not the tool you want for that. But maybe we do have tools already for that big swimming pool. This could be something to augment to help us find that myriad of very small breeding sites. So with that, I will end. I apologize if I've gone a little bit over time, but uh, I'd like to acknowledge the, uh, the many groups that are involved in, in this research, uh, both collaborators, uh, uh, commercial uh, partners, and then also uh, the funding agency. So thank you very much.